Uh, Well, good morning. I'm James Gerber, the student ministries pastor here at New Hope. Um, And this morning, we will be continuing our series called Transformed. Um, And this morning, I have the privilege of talking about our transformation through the Holy Spirit. Now, you may be thinking, didn't we just do a series on the fruit of the Spirit where we talk about transformation by the Holy Spirit through abiding with Jesus? And the answer to that is, yes, we did. (laughs) Yes, we did. But hey, you know what? A little little repetition never hurt anybody. Yeah? Yeah. So we're going to dive back in. And unique to this, we're going to do something a little bit different, okay? We're going to, we're going to uh, zoom out a little bit. We didn't really do this in, in our uh, Fruit of the Spirit series. And so first thing we'll do is we're going to look at the big picture of God's promise of the Holy Spirit for, for us. Second, what we'll do is we'll zoom way in and we'll look at one big problem that I think most of us face that I would argue stunts our growth and keeps us from being transformed by the Holy Spirit. And then third, we are going to look at one practice that we can engage with that will position us to be transformed by the Holy Spirit and into the image of Jesus. So uh, the roadmap for today, um, three movements, his promise, our problem, one practice. Sound good? All right, let me pray for us and we'll jump in. Jesus, we just open ourselves up to you. God, we open ourselves up to your Holy Spirit and the work that you want to do in us. God, I pray that we could be learners this morning. God, that we could learn from you and your word as you speak to us in this place, Lord. So do your thing, Lord. We are listening. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I remember when I was first becoming a Christian or first attending church, um, the early part of my faith journey, I was a little confused about the Holy Spirit. Anybody else? Like, what's the deal with the Holy Spirit? Uh, in one moment, preachers were talking about receiving Jesus into your hearts, and in the next breath, preachers were talking about um, being filled with the Holy Spirit. I started to understand this idea over time of, of the Holy Spirit giving us power, right? That there was power from the Holy Spirit, but I was like, what is this? Like, is it like a force? Is it like is it like the force in Star Wars? Like, what is the Holy, Holy Spirit? Um, I started to understand. Uh, it, I also remember um, uh, there would be these long stretches where we wouldn't talk about the Holy Spirit at all in church, right? And then we would suddenly talk about the Holy Spirit, but it would only be in the context of speaking in tongues or the fruit of the Spirit, which is also confusing. Why was that the only time we talked about the Holy Spirit? And then as a parent, I also remember several times as my kids were, you know, starting to get curious about Jesus and can talk and could ask questions, they would inevitably ask, how is it that a tiny little Jesus lives inside of my heart and inside of their heart and inside of their heart, right? That's not exactly how it works. There's not a G.I. Joe-sized uh, Jesus that lives in each of our hearts. He's obviously microscopic, so he's very tiny. No, <laughs> that's not how it works either, but we'll get to that. But in all seriousness, the Holy Spirit can be a little confusing, especially if we haven't been around church for a while. Um, so what I want to do is start off by giving just a flyby, right? Like not super in depth, but a flyby of the Holy Spirit throughout Scripture. So um, uh, the Holy Spirit is God's promise to us as followers of Jesus. So let's start way back at the beginning. Adam and Eve, right? Adam and Eve had full access to God, right? They had God literally walking with them. His presence was with them all of the time. And they mucked it up, right? They sinned, right? They chose to go their own way rather than listening to the voice of the Lord. They listened to the voice of the serpent. And between Genesis 3 and Acts chapter 1, there's very limited direct access to God's presence, right? And it almost always involves some sort of intermediary, right? And these intermediaries were often priests or prophets uh, and sometimes leaders like Moses, which we will touch on later. Uh, And a very rare, like very rarely did the Spirit come upon anybody except for maybe to, just for a very short time to accomplish maybe a specific task that he had for them, right? And again, it was very rare. Only a handful of times you see in Scripture that the Spirit fills somebody before the New Testament or is upon somebody uh, to accomplish something. But throughout history, God has been speaking through his prophets. uh, And about a day when the Spirit would come and take up residency within us, right? through the work of the Holy Spirit and, again, through the work of the Messiah. God used the prophets like Ezekiel to tell us that there would be a future when the Spirit would take a residency in the human heart uh, and transform us. It says this in Ezekiel 36. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. He also spoke through the prophet Joel to let us know that, the, that his spirit wouldn't just be available to um, one people group, right? 
or just one gender or just a really specific age group, but really to anybody, right? So this is in Joel 2. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. Uh, And then Jesus echoed this promise of the coming Holy Spirit to his disciples, which would also include us because what we are disciples of Jesus, right? Uh, John 14 says this, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be with you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, because I live, you also live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. Okay, and I'm not sure if you caught all the things, but I'll walk back through this. But Jesus describes the Holy Spirit as our advocate or helper, as Melinda pointed out, right? One who comes alongside us. Um, the very presence of God with us so that we're not left alone like orphans, right? But we have somebody with us, right? So that we can navigate life. We're not just defend for ourselves like orphans who are alone. And not just that, Jesus describes the Holy Spirit as a person, right? Like not just an it, but he uses a he, right? The he. It's it's not this impersonal force, but a person, the third person of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, right? Right? So God in the form of spirit. Jesus also says this um, about the spirit in John 14. But the advocate, there's that word again, the spirit whom the father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Again, the spirit's our advocate, right? But also our teacher. Also reminds us of what is right and wrong. The spirit, and some, some would say convicts us is a way of saying that, right? Of what is right and wrong. Convicts us of sin. And Jesus and other writers refer to the person of the Holy Spirit as being our source of power, right? Acts chapter 1 it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So we're given power, right, to be witnesses both here, near, and far, to share uh, to those who are in our lives about Jesus, or about the gospel, and about the life that Jesus has on offer. And then both Paul, Paul in both Romans and Ephesians, uh, reminds us that the same power that resurrected Jesus, right, back from the dead, lives in us through the Holy Spirit, uh, and is making us new and resurrecting us in, to new life and to new people. Um, and as we talked about in the fruit, of Holy, or the fruit of the Spirit series, over time, the Spirit does a work that transforms us into people of love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and of course, everybody's favorite, self-control. All of this to say the Holy Spirit, right, is God's promise to us as followers of Jesus and is available to each of us who, has re- who have received and trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Okay, so the quick recap. The Holy Spirit is our source for a new heart. The Spirit is our advocate. He's our helper. He's our teacher. He is our reminder. He is our companion. The Spirit is our source of power. He gives us power to be his witnesses. And ultimately, his resurrection power through the Holy Spirit is transforming us into people of love, joy, peace, all of those things from the inside out, right? All of the fruit of the Spirit. And God's promises, right, of his Holy Spirit, those are wonderful, right? Yeah? Good stuff. (laughs) And on paper, that all sounds really awesome, right? So here's the million-dollar question, just to ponder. Why do we get stuck? Why do we get stuck, then, if the Holy Spirit's in us, right? Why are there areas of our lives that remained unchanged? Why are there areas that... We want to be different, but they're not different, right? The difficulty that we all face is that we desire to be transformed, yet often we stay the same. Anybody experience that? Okay, good, I'm not the only human here. Uh, The reality is our transformation usually takes, it's usually harder, it's slower, and it takes longer than we think it should, right? Yeah, 
And there's one problem that pretty much all of us face that I want to talk about as American, Western, modern Christians, okay? And it's this, the one problem. I promise you we talk about one problem. Most of us are moving too fast at too fast of a pace and are far too busy and distracted for God to do a deep transforming work in our lives. Yeah, I'll say that again. Most of us are moving at, uh, at too fast of a pace and are far too busy and distracted for God to do a deep transforming work in our lives. I wonder if you've noticed this, right? And I'll, I'll have you help me out in just a second. Uh, when you ask most people how they're doing, like, how you been doing lately? <laughs> most people answer with the same thing, right? Good, we've just been really busy. <laughs> right. I think I just said that the other day when somebody asked me how I've been doing. And the reality is we're moving too fast. We're trying to fit way too much into our days. There's just too much going on. Um, in the 1930s, I chuckled when I came across this, right? In the 1930s, economists were predicting that by the year 2030, Americans would work only 15 hours a week because of all of the time-saving devices and appliances and machinery that had been coming out, right? So think about it. Factories were becoming more automated, right? And so it's like, yeah, man, if machines can do the work, right? Uh, the first fully automated washer with a spin cycle. Praise the Lord for spin cycles, am I right? Like that we don't have to just wash them by hand. Um, came out in the 1930s. And obviously, because of all of these time-saving things, right, we would, because we could, fill that extra time with just leisure, create some more space to just be with the Lord, you know. <laughs> they were wrong. <laughs> Newsflash, they were wrong. Uh, instead, we work longer days, and we work harder, and we work more hours, and then we use the time-saving devices that we have so that we can save the time to do more things as fast as we can and pack as much as we can into 24 hours, the same 24 hours that humans have had since the beginning of time, right? We're still working with the same constraints. And the result is that we are almost always in a hurry. We're just going from one thing to the next. Can anybody relate to this in the room right now? Yeah. Okay, you guys ready for a quote from Richard J. Foster that's going to just ruin your day? <laughs> All right, well, here we go. Ruin mine. <laughs> it says, in contemporary society, which we are living in, right, our adversary, a.k.a. the devil, majors in three things, noise, hurry, and crowds. If he can keep us engaged in muchness and manyness, he will rest satisfied. Psychiatrist Carl Jung once remarked, hurry is not of the devil, it is the devil, right? Uh, I could, when I read that, I could not stop thinking about the song by Van Halen. Running with the devil. Ow! Yeah, I don't know. That was just stuck in my mind. Because he's at a fast pace, all right? But all joking aside, I think he's getting to the heart of our, of our lack of transformation. If the adversary, right, the devil, can keep us busy and in a hurry, he will keep us from being formed into the image of Jesus, and he will he will likely form us into his image, right? I mean, think about this for a second. Did you ever, do you read the Gospels, do you ever see Jesus in a hurry? No. Do you ever see Jesus super stressed out about getting from one place to the next? <laughs> right? No. Do you see other people annoyed by Jesus and how slow he goes and how he takes his time? Yes, right? Lots of examples. <laughs> I don't have time to tell you about them, but they're there. A well-known Japanese theologian made this observation. He said, love has its speed. It is a spiritual speed. It is a different kind of speed from the technological speed to which we are accustomed. It goes on in the depth of our life, whether we notice it or not, a three mile, at three miles an hour. It is a speed we walk, and therefore the speed, the it, <laughs> therefore the speed the love of a God walks. As followers of Jesus, we are, actually called down to, we are actually called to slow down our lives to the pace of God. If we want to experience transformation into the image of Jesus, we need to adjust to God's pace. Simple, right? <laughs> Easily said. And over and again, God calls us to slow down our lives, slow down our frantic pace to be with him, to be at his pace. We're called to walk with God, right? By the way, three miles per hour is the speed of walking. That was that whole thing. 
walk with God, to match his pace, right? And we are called to allow him to go before us oftentimes in scripture so that we can follow him, right? The invitation of Jesus was exactly that, right? In Matthew chapter 11, it says, walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Paul says this in Galatians. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. The idea of keeping in step with the Spirit is that we are matching God's pace, right? That we are lockstep with the Spirit. Not getting out ahead, right? Not outpacing God. Paul also says this in Galatians. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And another version says this. I love it. I, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what you want or what your sinful nature craves. So we walk with God, but God is still the leader, right? You can walk with somebody and allow them to be, take the lead, yeah? The problem for most of us is that we try to get out ahead of God with our lives. Anybody else get out ahead of God sometimes just a little bit? <laughs> yeah, and so what can we do? The question is, what can we do to slow ourselves down to the pace of God? Is there something we can do that, would pos- that we could do to position ourselves for God to do a deep transforming work in our lives. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at a somewhat obscure story in the Old Testament. Obscure, yet Dave happened to mention it last week, but I'd already planned on talking about it, so he stole my stuff. So we're going to go back to that, right? Uh, because there's something really profound here that I want us to grab onto. I think if we can grab onto this and, 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 and apply this to our lives, it can be something that can really transform us. It happens in Exodus 34, right? Moses has gone up to Mount Sinai. He's went up the side of the mountain, uh, and he receives and he writes down the Ten Commandments, right? You guys know the story? Charlton Heston goes up there. The mountain. No, that's... Uh, and, and while he's up there, he's in God's presence, something weird happens. You guys remember what happens Dave talked about last week? His face shines, right? His face starts to shine from being in the presence of God. It says this in Exodus 34. When Moses went down from Mount Sinai, carrying the Ten Commandments, his face was shining but because he had been speaking with the Lord. But he didn't know it, right? And as you read on, you find out that Moses started to put a veil over his face so that the people wouldn't notice that the glory would fade over time, right? Which really cracks me up <laughs> because he's like, he goes up in the glory, his face is shining and he puts the veil over. Like, he's like, I'm kind of a big deal. I've got a shining face. And they're like, man, I wonder if it's still shining behind that veil. Dude, he's a real, he's a real big, and he's thinking, they don't know if I got the shine face still. Yeah, I'm kind of a big deal. I got that thing. But the glory faded, right? It didn't stay like that. But it says every time that he went into the presence of the Lord, right? He took the veil off and his, um, then his face would shine once again. Okay, so the story of Moses, right? With the story of Moses in mind, Paul wrote about how it's different for us as believers of Jesus who have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, right? 2 Corinthians 3 says this. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who have unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into the image of or into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So Paul's getting at a few things, okay? Similar to Moses, um, when we are with God, we are transformed straight up, right? Just like the whole Fruit of the Spirit series. You want to know more about that? Go watch that series. It's really good. Every week is awesome. Two, uh, but unlike Moses, right, when we are with God, our transformation actually sticks around. Like, it's ever increasing is the language he uses so that we become more and more like Jesus over time. It doesn't just fade, right? And for us, our access is direct, right? We don't have to go up a mountain to be with God, but we have the spirit of God living inside us. So we have the ability to commune with God at any given moment, at any given time within our minds and our hearts. Yeah? Okay. What does this story have to do about slowing ourselves down to the pace of God? I'm glad you asked, because I'm going to tell you. Here's the thing. When our lives are full of distraction, and they are frantic, and full of hurry, and over busy, and consumed by muchness and manyness, the Holy Spirit may be living in us, but we're just sharing space with the Holy Spirit, right? We're just sharing space. Um, Have you ever um, 
I've noticed this happening, right? Have you ever been in a room with a bunch of people and then look up and realize I'm actually alone in this room with a bunch of people? This has happened to me quite a few times lately, but um, I'll just, you know, for a second be on my phone and in a group of people. And then I'll look up and I'll realize every person in the room is on their phone and we're actually here together, but we're not really together, right? And here's the thing, when our lives are full of distraction and frantic and full of hurry and over busy and consumed by all the things, right? Muchness and manyness. The Holy Spirit may be living in us, but we are just sharing space, right? The Spirit is here with us, but we're just crushing candy. <laughs> or is that a thing? I don't know. Checking our status, looking at a video. And he's like, I'm here. And we're just busy. And here's the thing. Moses' transformation, right? It didn't happen just because he was in the same space with God. It was because he was talking with God. It says he was talking with God. That's a detail that they chose to include. And I think it matters. In the same way, our transformation doesn't just happen because the Spirit is in us. According to Paul, our transformation happens because we contemplate the Lord's glory. Also a detail that he put in there. And I think it matters. So we're going to look at verse 18 again and unpack that for just a second, okay? 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all, with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Okay, so let's look at that word contemplate. The word contemplate used here is interesting, right? The word uh, in the Greek, I don't know, it doesn't even matter. Katok trizo, doesn't matter. Um, sometimes it's translated contemplate, <laughs> like we have here, right? In some versions of the Bible, you'll read it. Other times you'll read a Bible and it's going to say, it's going to be translated as behold. Sometimes it's going to be translated as the word mirror or reflectance, which is really interesting. And some translations even say behold as in a mirror, right? The idea of beholding something as, in, as if you were looking in a mirror, which I think is what best captures the idea. A lot of people would agree with that. To contemplate, by definition, means to look thoroughly at something for a long time or to have deep, reflective thought about something. In this case, hopefully the Lord. Question for you. Is it really possible to contemplate what your face looks like in a reflection, right, in a mirror, if you're running past the mirror full speed? Is it possible to really get a good look at your face? No, right? Like, any, any ladies have a face routine they do in the morning? Yes, or whatever, yeah? You need the makeup and the, the things, right? It takes time, right? And I lost my, my place here. There it is. Yes, it takes time. You can't just... To contemplate the Lord's glory is to slow down. To have deep, reflective thought in your mind about God. And to take the time to look towards God, setting aside all other things, to look to and think about God. That's a huge sentence, but, and it's probably got commas in the wrong places. I don't know, I'm not an English major. But by doing this, you are transformed into the image of Jesus. Put more simply, you become what you behold, right? You become the thing that you give your heart and your time and your attention and your mind to. You become what you behold. So the question I asked earlier, is there something that we can do that would position us for God to do a deep transforming work? The answer is, yeah, I think there is. <laughs> so what I'd like to invite you to look into with me is a practice, right? A spiritual discipline, if you will. Practice sounds less, you know, <laughs> less intimidating. Spiritual discipline that Christians have been doing for centuries that have helped Christian after Christian, disciple of Jesus after disciple of Jesus, to be transformed into the image of Jesus. To contemplate the glory of the Lord. Okay? The practice, what is it called? Contemplation. Or at least contemplative practices in general. Con contemplation is kind of a general name for a category of spiritual disciplines as well as a discipline itself. Um, and this isn't an exact list behind me, right, of contemplative practices, but it's at least a few of them. It's not exhaustive. Um, in my definitions, you know, you might look up one of these and go, oh, I found a different definition online. 
you will do that. That will happen because there isn't exactly a perfect or clear definition about, of these con contemplative practices. But let's walk through each one real quick and, and just talk about these as that slide stays up there. Meditation, a.k.a. contemplation. Yes, meditation is a Christian practice, in case you're wondering. <laughs> Has been from the very get-go. Uh, but not just to empty your minds, right? You think of, people think of meditation, they go, it's emptying your minds, right? No, no, it's not just to empty your minds. It's not as much about emptying your minds as, as it is um, opening your minds up and your heart up uh, and imagination up to God so that it may be filled by him, right? Um, it can include meditation with scripture along with it, but it's just opening yourself up to be filled with the thoughts of God, right? Silence and solitude, that's pretty straightforward, but it's just getting alone with God, quieting yourself, and opening yourself up to God. Doesn't necessarily require scripture. It's just you and God in a solitary place. Centering prayer. Have you heard of this before? Centering prayer typically uses just a word or a phrase to help center our attention and offer a focal point for us in our posture of prayer. Um, uh, one that's been around for, forever is this, like a, a short sentence. One is, uh, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. And oftentimes, uh, they, it's encouraged that you would inhale and exhale as you pray this, right? So you would be inhaling, and in your mind you'd be saying, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, exhale, have mercy on me, a sinner. Right? And it doesn't have to just be that. Uh, for me, my go-to phrase that I often use is, Jesus, I inhale your peace, and I exhale my anxiety. Or you can grab a hold of a verse or a phrase, um, but the idea is that it helps to center you and draw your attention towards the Lord. Listening prayer. A method of silent prayer, right? Because you're listening. Just sitting in the presence of God and listening to him, listening for him to speak to you. Uh, in listening prayer, you allow the Lord to speak into your insecurities and your fears just the things that come to mind as you wait on the Lord. All of these quiet moments open us up to God in a way that a lot of the other practices just don't. So that's why I'm presenting them, right? So I want to take a moment to acknowledge a couple things, right? Um, in, a sec, I'll talk, in a second, I'll talk about how difficult contemplative practices are, right? Because they're foreign to us and we're so used to noise, it's hard to be quiet before God. It's hard to just even have Quiet, even if we're not thinking about God, right? It's difficult. Two, uh, I'm going to talk about what you may experience, right, when you get quiet before the Lord. You may think that you're doing it wrong. Um, you may think that what happens to you, oh, I, think I, I don't think I'm doing it right, but I would say that what happens to you in that quiet time, I'll describe what can happen, is often the thing that needs to happen for God to do his deepest work, Okay. Okay, so the first thing. It's not easy to be silent before the Lord, but it opens us up to the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, so what I want to do is just acknowledge that for some of us, and maybe this is you, you are terrified to be in the quiet. Quiet scares you, right? And many people begin to feel anxiety or panic or just fear when they lower the noise of their life and when they lower the speed of their life. About five years ago, um, I was a part of a leading a rooted group, and we had a woman in our group. I'm going to call her Becky. Becky. Um, and she opened up, right, um, about being terrified about the prayer experience. And during rooted, you have this prayer experience where you spend some time praying together, and then you spend this, like, long time being alone with the Lord and just praying. And she was freaking out about that, right? Because she was afraid that what would, she was afraid of the things that would come up in her mind and in her body when she got really quiet, right? In fact, she noticed that any time she got quiet in her life, the hard things of life would come back, would just bubble up in the back of her mind, right? Family of origin stuff, fractured relationships, money problems. They would just all kind of work their way to the surface, and for years, she made sure she didn't have quiet moments. She just worked at pushing them down, right? With the noise. Always had music on the car. Always had music playing with her all the time. Um, always, always posting Facebook Live videos or videos just to catch up in her spare time, right? Always scrolling, always on Instagram, always having music on, right? 
But here's the thing. Oh, just always making sure she was busy. But here's the thing. The things that are going on under the surface that are not felt and are not dealt with, they don't just go away. Yeah? They don't just go away. They usually just stay under the surface and they swirl around and then they resurface at the wrong times <laughs> and in the wrong ways, typically how we do not want them to, right? Sometimes it's in the form of anger. Sometimes it's in impatience. Sometimes it's in violence. Sometimes it's in unhealthy coping skills, right? And coping with unhealthy habits and things. What Becky was describing, I would say is not uncommon, right? Um, Henry Nouwen describes what his attempts of, of quiet contemplation led to with some honesty and some vulnerability. And he's like this master apprentice of Jesus, okay? So keep in mind, he's an incredible writer on spiritual formation, particularly on the contemplative practices. And here's what he says. I think you can probably relate to this. In solitude, I get rid of my scaffolding. No friends to talk with. No telephone calls to make. No meetings to attend. No music to entertain. No books to distract. Just me, naked or clothed, you know, either way. Vulnerable, weak, sinful, deprived, broken. Nothing. As soon as I decide to stay in my solitude, confusing ideas, disturbing images, wild fantasies, and weird associations jump about in my mind like monkeys in a banana tree. Anybody relate to that? Oh, that thing, that thing. Anger and greed begin to show up, or show their ugly faces. I give long, hostile speeches to my enemies. Anybody do that? Like, I'll, I'll tell them. <laughs> Just let me rehearse the whole thing. And dream lustful, lustful dreams in which I'm wealthy and influential and very attractive. Or poor, ugly, and in need of immediate consolation. Thus, I try again to run from the dark abyss of my nothingness and restore my false self in all its vainglory. The task is to, pres- is to persevere in my solitude, to stay in my cell until all my seductive visitors get tired of pounding on my door and leave me alone. Good stuff, right? <laughs> I think that about describes when I've tried to do silence and solitude. Here's the thing. We all tend to flee from quiet and stillness. We do it with, you know, just doing noisy and fast things, right? We all, and then when we try to do it, we flee from it, right? We tend to do that. But it, I, I would offer that it's where God does his best work. The quiet space in contemplation with God is like a fiery furnace that heats up and the dross of our lives gets brought to the surface so that God can remove it from our lives or do something with it at the very least to purify us, right? It's like that picture of heating up gold till it's liquid form and all of the impurities move to the surface so that it can scrape it off and what you're left with is pure gold, right? As followers of Jesus, I think that we are, I think we are inviting, we are invited by him to place these things that come to the surface before God and to feel the feels and to feel the feels with God, not on our own. And of course, not, not at all, right? And to place them under his care. It says this in first Peter five, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxieties, or cast all your cares, one version says, on him because he cares for you, right? Here's the thing. Jesus wants to carry the weight of what you are going through, and he wants to heal it too, right? He wants to take the anxiety of your, anxiety of your life, and he wants to exchange it for peace. I think I said this last week, not in my notes, but what's hidden can't be healed, Right? And we move so fast that just by the sheer speed of our life, we are actually causing those things to remain hidden deep inside of us. And they're just waiting to come out so that the Lord can do something with them. Silence, this is what one writer says, and I love this. Silence is an invitation for the presence of God to occupy and reside in our hearts and mind. Silence intentionally works at dethroning the thoughts of the fallen self and flesh 
by continually releasing and letting go of them. Solitude is more than a place. It's a sacred space for the spirit of God and man to dwell joined heart to heart. Solitude and contemplative silence is the journey of the soul into an eternal destination with the divine. It's good, right? Listen, when we give God access to our stuff, he can heal it. He can transform us. And who better to trust and process with, right, than our advocate, than the one who's for us, right? Than our healer, who can heal us. <laughs> than our counselor, who can counsel us on what we're to do with it. Than our ever-present help, who's there wanting to help us. Than our teacher, than our companion, who wants to be with us. All right, let's make it practical. Like, how do we do this? How can we integrate this into our everyday life, okay? As we close here. How can I put into practice these contemplative practices in my everyday life? Plus a few tips and tricks, because that's how we do. Here's what I'd say. Number one, make the first thing that you do, like when you wake up in the morning, spending a few minutes quiet before the Lord. And I would say this is like addition by subtraction. For the, and the subtraction of what? I'll tell you in a second. But for the vast majority of us, one of the first things that we do when we wake up is we grab our phones. and turn, <laughs> We grab our phones or we turn on music. Anybody else like grab your phone when you wake up? A lot of people do. There's a stat that says that on 67% of Americans admitted to sleeping with their phones. 90% of 18 to 29-year-olds say that they sleep with their phones. It's tough not to have it be the first thing you reach for if it's right next to you, right? Also guilty. <laughs> like, I don't want my alarm clock to not wake me up, and I don't want to wake up Ashley. The whole thing, right? But for me, <laughs> even just trying to resist that, right? The first thing that I do, right, the first few minutes before I even get out of bed, before my feet touch the ground, before I reach for my phone, I simply just try to open myself up to God's presence. Just to have some listening <laughs> prayer. Not asking for anything at first, but just having God before my mind, right? And then typically I'll transition into the breathing prayer, right? Sometimes it's, yeah, I'm feeling anxious. You want to wake up and think about all the stuff that has to happen. All right, Lord, I breathe out my anxiety and I breathe in your presence. I breathe in your presence and I breathe, exhale my anxiety. Lord, I invite you into all of that stuff. And then usually it Usually I move into asking the Lord just to empower me for the day, right? Lord, would you help me to love the people that I come in contact with, starting with my family and then moving outwards? Would you help me to love people well? That's usually where I'm headed. Bonus pointer here. Already bonus in point number one. I think posture matters. It doesn't have to be a thing, but... Um, Part of, I think part of what works with that time for me is that I stay laying down, right? Like throughout scripture, um, we're commanded to like worship the Lord. It's interesting because in pretty much every, uh, every word that's used for worship, there's some element of being prostrate before the Lord, which means like laying close to the ground. Sometimes face down, right? Usually face down. And throughout scripture, when people encounter the Lord, they can't help but fall on the ground and be on their faces. Isaiah 6 and Ezekiel, it happens, right? So there's something to that posture and choosing the place of humility, right? And so I, there's something to that, and I think it works for me, and I think it's really helpful to stop or to just remain laying down in a humble posture. And it doesn't have to be that, right? Like, I think some of my best times with the Lord is when I just contemplate Him on walks, just quietly by myself, go on walks. So you can do either of those things. All right, number two, turn off and limit the noise you usually fill the silence with, right? We use music, podcasts, and phone calls, and Marco Polos to fill feel, feel the silence, right? And these can all be missed opportunities to connect with the Lord. We take those spaces for granted because we're so used to filling them up. But these are the quiet, these are the rhythms that the Lord has put in our lives to use these quiet opportunities to connect with him instead of filling it with noise. 
we hate being bored, right? We're like, we are just not about being bored. Putting your phone on do not disturb mode, turning off the notifications to your social media platforms. Those are ways that you can connect with God more easily because here's what's happening when you do that. You are choosing when you use your device. Your device is no longer getting to tell you when to use it, yeah? So you get to be the master of this thing <laughs> instead of this thing being the master of you. Because that, that's what happens, right? Pick me up. Engage with me. Do the things. We can choose that. We can choose to put, even if it's just for a little while, or you can choose the ones that really need to come through, right? For me, I occasionally just drive in silence. Like, I like putting on music and I like putting on podcasts and all the things, I like learning stuff. But sometimes I just need to put it on silent so that I can be with the Lord. Yeah? It's a great way to do it. Just so I can present my stuff to Him, just so I can open myself for what, up for what He might want to say to me. And the third thing I'll encourage you with is just this. Don't give up. Like, keep trying to create space to be sound for the Lord. Because it's not easy, but it's really worth it, okay? For me, it's really hard too. I can guarantee you it's hard for the other pastors on staff. There's not like super Christians who don't struggle with this a little bit. Like, I was in the middle of the week, I was like, man, I feel like I need to spend just some silent time with the Lord. And so I set my phone. I was like, I'll skip 15 minutes, you know? Four times <laughs> I went to my phone. I was like, I better write that note down before I forget the thing that I, four times. I couldn't make it 15 minutes. But I'm gonna try again, okay? I'm not gonna give up because it was hard. Because I know that it's good for me to be quiet before the Lord, to contemplate the Lord. And here's the thing, is that usually the things that are the best for us are not easy, Right? Silence and contemplation with the Lord is like going to the gym for your soul. Yeah. But here's the thing with the Lord is that all we need to do is get to the gym. And the Lord does all the heavy lifting, right? It's that idea of being on the vine, of abiding with Jesus. What we need to do is just get to the gym. The Lord will do all the heavy lifting. He's the one who does the transformation. He's the one who changes us from the inside out. It's his spirit that does the work in us. What we do is we make ourselves available for his presence, to contemplate him, to talk with him, to be with him so that he can transform us from the inside out. So let's take advantage of the opportunities that he's given us throughout our day to do that rather than continuing to walk at the frantic pace of our culture that never wants you to stop, that says you can never consume enough media you can never get enough stuff. You can never have enough vacations. You can never stop. I'm here to tell you, you can stop. You can stop. And you can be with Jesus so that he can transform you.